two dozen phone calls to, uh, um, you know, sent out about two dozen emails and made a bunch of phone calls trying to track down some of the other local DJs to give a little more perspective on one opinion on this. And out of the half dozen or so responses I've received so far, uh, they were pretty much all, I would love to do it, but I can't get off work, or I'm out of town. One guy in Austin, Texas, um, who does the, uh, one of the techno shows at WRBU on the weekend is apparently doing some kind of wireless convention out in Texas. and. He was talking about just kind of calling in sick and flying back early the last day to appear on the panel. It's like, no, dude, really, you're making money out there. You know, it's okay. And I appreciate it. But basically, what I'm going to be talking about um, is getting access to the airwaves, which is kind of a tough thing for a lot of people to do these days. Um, and relay my experiences and how I've managed to do it. And uh, so we've got to focus mainly on radio stations in and around Nashville, but you know, this will apply to just about any other large or larger um, urban area. And uh, good luck to you if you want to uh, pursue this and get on the air and have fun with it. I've enjoyed uh, DJing at WRBU. I did a show there from 1994 to 2001. Every week had a blast and made a lot of new friends that way. And um, I was never a Vanderbilt student and kind of socially engineered my way into that, so I guess that's how this will tie into hacking, quote unquote. Um, you get in on the technical side if you want to build transmitters and go out and do pirate radio, which I'll talk about that in a moment too, or you can apply your uber lead social engineering skills and get access to a transmitter that maybe technically legally you have no reason that, uh, uh, to be near at all whatsoever, which is pretty much what I did. So, if you haven't noticed, we does that a little bit. We're gonna get some bad feedback if, uh, if that continues. Check, 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 test. Yeah, okay, that sounds better. Um, my my experiences with radio actually started down in Gainesville, Florida, back in the late '80s when I was in college. I guess I can talk about this openly now since the statute of limitations has expired. Um, University of Florida is kind of a weird situation. They've got three radio stations down there. It's a pretty damn big university, one of the larger ones in the country. And they've got um, a commercial FM station and an AM station that's just a feeder off the FM, same content, different station IDs. And they had a second uh, FM station that was a non-commercial station, but it was pretty much classical music only. And um, it was all three of these radio stations were in the middle of the College of Journalism on the University of Florida campus, and students didn't have access to any of them. Um, the non-commercial station kind of, I can kind of see that, it's a similar situation to MTSU's WMOT, which is the non-commercial jazz station. But the uh, really crappy thing was that a few years before I started college down there, the student-run FM radio station had come up for its uh, seven-year annual, or seven-year periodic FCC license renewal. And most FM stations have their license renewed every seven years or so and make sure that they are serving the community appropriately in the area to which they cover and broadcast, blah, blah, blah. And the university did a very interesting thing. They basically bought the student FM radio station and uh, its AM theater from the College of Journalism 
and then turned around and sold it to a commercial entity. Uh, would be the equivalent of KDF back when they were still broadcasting rock here in Nashville or whatever the new rock station is here. So you have a radio station facilities that for years have um, belonged to the College of Journalism and been operated by students. It was suddenly yanked out kind of from underneath the feet and sold to a commercial entity that said, you're not allowed. Uh, yeah, question in the back. If you got questions, raise your hand and I'll try to get to you. Yeah. Yeah, apparently they're still happening up in the Northeast. A lot of colleges have decided it's too expensive to run their own and they're doing exactly the same thing. So, okay, the, the comment was it's apparently it's, it's happening a lot in the Northeast. Even today, a lot of colleges are deciding it's too expensive to run their own and they're selling them. Um, get with me after this talk. I'd be interested in finding out specifically which ones are doing that and when they went through. That's kind of a disturbing trend. Um, and as I was saying, you had this situation where all of a sudden the station that student had, students had access to was basically taken away from them and turned over to a commercial entity that threw them all out and, and said, you know, basically don't give a shit about you, we're here to make money. And thus was born WRAG, where we go, alternative games home, with uh, two, sque two screaming watts of power at the bottom of the FM barrel, I think they were broadcasting on 87.9, if I remember correctly. And basically, the station started out at one lot with what later became the Ramsey FM 10 stereo transmitter kit. And um, it, at one lot, even, this radio station could pretty much cover every, uh, every place in Alachua County, which is where the University of Florida and Gainesville are located. Uh, the signal was kind of crappy. Uh, if you're broadcasting at the lower end of the, the spectrum, you, have, uh, you don't um, FM band, basically you're not going to cover as much area as you do on a higher band. That's why your larger commercial FM stations tend to be up near the top of the FM band, around 106, 107. Their range is just a bit farther compared to the ones broadcasting in the bottom of the FM band, which would be, in this case, here in Nashville, um, WRBU 91.1 FM and WMTS, which is the 200 watt student station at MTSU. So, since we were a pirate station operating very illegally on you know, a somewhat erratic schedule, um, you know, we couldn't really let people know when we were broadcasting with any regularity, although we tried to do uh, five or six hours a day and move the transmitter pretty frequently. Um, and we also took great pains not to interfere with any of the other commercial stations that were on the air. We, just, we would pick up empty frequencies and we would put posters and uh, flyers up on telephone poles around campus and some of the indie music stores that thought it was neat. Um, I even brought up uh, in one of my radio classes, uh, asked the professor what they thought about um, uh, WRAG and uh, it was kind of an odd reaction. They didn't like it. They, they were like, these people are criminals. They need to go to jail. They're breaking the law, blah, 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 blah. And they kind of failed to see the whole point that, well, the reason they did this was because the students now no longer had access to any of the broadcast facilities here at the university and in the College of Journalism, which were paying money to attend, but you won't let us near the equipment. Yeah, so that's kind of fucked up and wrong to you. But whatever. So. Um, uh, I was also kind of very, getting very disillusioned with my journalism degree at the time. Um, the first radio class I took was pretty much a quote, because it surprised the hell out of me. Uh, first day in that class, the professor said, if you were here because you want to play um, cool and interesting music on the air, you're, um, you're basically in the wrong place and you may want to investigate going out and learning how to DJ at clubs and stuff and, and forget about a career in radio. Uh, and basically, commercial radio exists for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is you pick whatever you are broadcasting, whether it's music, news, uh, whatever, to attract a target audience, and then you sell advertising to that target audience, and you make your money off your ad rates. And, uh, yeah, Clear Channel, it's a very good example of that, I'll get to in a bit. I thought that just kind of sucked, because, you know, there's a lot of radio spectrum out there, and Radio can reach a lot of people, and I think it can be used for more than, um, at least the, the broadcast stuff that we listen to, it can, can be used for more than just selling commercials, you know, with music or news or whatever as filler to attract people. And if you listen to most commercial FM radio stations, that's what they're there for. They are there to maybe play a few songs to get you to listen and then fill everything between songs with 
commercial, so when you go out and buy stuff or do whatever it is they're advertising they're trying to sell you. And that's the sole reason for their existence, and that's all they care about, and that's why a lot of commercial radio is, it sucks, it sucks for oil. Um, if you don't want to get, if you want to do the pirate route, um, don't do what WRAG did after I left, and I'm glad I was part of that because I got fined pretty heavily when they were caught. Um, don't smoke up a lot before you go on the air and get lazy about moving the transmitter and broadcast your regular schedule from the same spot for weeks on end. Because eventually the FCC will track you down and get a knock on your door. And, uh, you can send them away. You don't have to let the FCC guys in unless they've actually got cops in a search warrant. But you know, if it gets to that point, you're pretty much screwed. They know where you are. These are smart people. They can track transmitters down. And if you get served, uh, right now the current fines are running between ten and fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, um, I believe FCC now gets a percentage of the fines that they serve too, so they've got a real incentive to go out and serve fines. And kind of checking the repeal laws, and that's what you want to talk about. I have a question back here, yes sir. Do they? Um, does the FCC keep track of bandwidth or, or radio frequency in all areas, or do they only get? Do they only? Um, they, they're pretty much reactive. They investigate when they receive calls. And I'll give you an example of that um, in a little bit when I get to my experiences with WRBU. Uh, one of the interesting things, a couple of the interesting things I found that the Euro Pirates did, um, uh, they had two basic methods for doing this. One was the uh, kind of the hit and run broadcasters would get, and this is very clever, um, old cassette players out of uh, cars, like car stereo in Nashville, you can pick those up dirt cheap now, and they would use those, they would record the show on tape, they would use the cassette player because, you know, it's been in the car, it's designed, it's engineered to be rugged and expect a lot of uh, bouncing around and not the best environmental conditions compared to like a really high-end stereo system you have at home, so they would yank those things out, have um, basically uh, uh, batteries and a timer, and a lot of them would string their antennas up with balloons and put them up in trees, and they would go set up their equipment somewhere out in the boonies on top of a big hill, have the timer set to broadcast after they had enough time to get away. At the end of the broadcast, um, everything would shut itself off, and they would kind of cruise by, and if there was no one in the area, they'd go pick up their equipment again. If um, you know, someone would track the equipment down, especially law enforcement people, you know, they'd feel they've lost 100 bucks worth of gear, it's not going to... Uh, not going to break you or anything. A lot of times you can get the in dash tape player and tape players for cheap. If you want to go the really expensive route, Radio Caroline probably pissed off more government officials in Europe than any other radio station in history. And what they did was they um, they outfitted a large boat and put some pretty powerful transmitters in AMF and shortwave. And just sat out in international waters. Uh, they were in a, well, it was technically a cove um, in the southern part of the United Kingdom, but they were, you know, they were clearly in international waters by several miles. They just sat out there and they broadcast decades. And no one could do anything about it. They couldn't shut them down. And, you know, um, and uh, they, were, they were in their heyday during the late 60s and the early 70s. Uh, you can do a Google on Radio Caroline and find out about their demise. Basically, the way that the British government got rid of it was they got tired of getting all these complaints, so they rewrote um, some of their laws and part of the Constitution and said, okay, our international waters extend this many miles now in this one small section just off the coast of the UK and nowhere else. Everything else is unchanged. But this one area beside our international waters push out now to 12 miles instead of 9 or whatever it was. So Radio Caroline had uh, to change locations. They parked out someplace on the, the North Sea, you know, off the coast of, on the North Sea, which was a lot stormier in this common area. And uh, a couple months after they did that, they got hit uh, during a pretty big storm. Their 300-foot mass on their boat collapsed, and they never really fully recovered after that. Um, eventually, I think the, the boat was seized uh, by the authorities and, and towed into a uh, dock and sat there riding for a while, but now it's being fixed up and it's going to be either a rest, uh, restaurant slash uh, historic site or something like that, so the boat's being salvaged, and that's pretty cool. Uh, there was a similar attempt to Radio Caroline back in the very late 80s and, um, that took place off um, uh, on the coast of uh, Long Island, up in the New York area. And this is, again, kind of disturbing behavior on the U.S. government part. The, uh, the ship was registered out of, I believe, Venezuela. And 
They had a couple of 10,000 watt transmitters on their pretty big music collection. Uh, they were very clearly in international waters. I think they were four miles out, if I remember correctly. They said, said they were at least one mile out in international waters. And they didn't even get a chance to go on the air. The second or third day they were doing um, power up, practice power ups and tuning the transmitters. They were uh, boarded by the, the Coast Guard. Um, who held them at gunpoint while FCC agents came on board, saw up the transmitters, and threw them over the side of the boat, and then walked out with the music collection and said, what are you going to do about it? Basically, the Coast Guard and the FCC committed an act of piracy in international waters against the ship registered to a, another government. And uh, there wasn't really a lot of mainstream media coverage about that, but um, pretty well documented in a book by Al Weiner, W-I-E, who was the guy responsible for that. And Lou Panic sells his book. Um, should I should have the title on the panel? Um, Google on Al Weiner and you'll find his book. I think it's uh, it's linked on the hobby broadcasting, that's one word, dot com site as well. Very interesting book. This guy is probably uh, America's biggest and most notorious uh, pirate radio operator. Now, pirate radio scares you off and you uh, don't have a whole lot of money, but you do want to play around with this. There's an interesting part of the FCC regs, you know, Part 15, which allows um, pretty much unlicensed transmitters that don't cause any interference up to one watt. And, okay, you might think, okay, one watt, what do you going to do with one watt? Well, again, with uh, radio alternative in Gainesville, we were able to cover um, pretty much everything in Gainesville city limits, and on good days, pretty much most of the last were counted with one watt, depending on where we have transmitter located. On top of a building like this, and this might be an interesting project for Freaknik 8 next year, uh, we try a one watt transmitter, make sure we're not interfering with anybody, and see how far it can be picked up. So, uh, if anyone wants to play with radio, any ham radio operators out there want to do some hands on with the gear, there's your project for next year at Kraken. Ramsey uh, Electronics sells a, a couple of different plumb lock kits that you can play around with too, and you can buy them pre assembled if you don't want to build them yourself. And moving on to bigger and more interesting, uh, as I said, I had a lot of fun with, uh, with WRAG and uh, when I did the rugby stuff for a couple of years before moving back up here to Nashville, and uh, was always a big fan of WRVU up here. How many people are familiar with WRVU, Pentecost Radio Station? Anyone? 91.1 on the FM dial, it's a student-run radio station broadcasting at 10,000 watts, and they used to be 14,500 watts, and then we realized that, oops, uh, our antenna is uh, higher at a higher elevation than we thought when we were originally licensed for our power output, and we were basically covering a whole lot of area outside where we were, we were officially licensed to cover, so they had to drop the transmitter power down to 10,000 watts about four years ago. But you can still hear WRVU pretty much all over Middle Tennessee and um, to the north. I know you can hear that in Clarksville and uh, Fort Campbell up over in Kentucky. When we were broadcasting at 14.5, uh, a lot of times we'd be picked up down in Alabama. Not far from Alabama, but uh, I've heard it down there myself on a couple of occasions. Helping someone move once, and I want to see how far I could pick up WRVU as I grow closer and closer to Tennessee. And, Heard them while I was still over the border in Alabama. Um, the way I got into WRDU is a little bit of bribery and knowing the right people and basic social engineering skills. Um, friends with people in several bands and uh, several defunct bands here and around Nashville, and uh, there was a lot of crossover between the local bands and some of the local DJs. And met one of the DJs because of uh, a local band called the Brain Plow and they don't exist anymore. Yes. Kind of, do you remember Brain Plow? Oh, yeah, Brain yeah, yeah, we have a weird, this is bizarre for Nashville, they were kind of a Nashville industrial goth rockabilly band, if you can believe it. <laughs> so, I think it all spankers. So, uh, the, uh, Grinning Plowman band members were friends with some WRVU DJs. I used to help out on Grinning Plowman shows a lot and started hanging out at parties and would throw at the radio station, sometimes on the air. Um, got to know a few DJs and uh, they couldn't buy booze legally and I could and there the connection was made and um, was told by the station manager at the time, tell you what, if you want to do a show during the summer when we're really not on the air that much, 
just uh, come to one of the regular sign-up meetings, you know how to run in the year, and when we get, hand out the sign-up forms, just put yourself down as a Vanderbilt alum. Okay, that worked. And uh, dating the station engineer a couple years later was another way to cover my ass. And uh, I just started the game doing a show every week. Um, there's an awful lot of people here, and that was fun. And my shows were usually on between midnight and 6 a.m., which is safe harbor hours. You can get away with a lot more. Technically, the only things you can't do during safe harbor hours is you can't say uh, some of George Carlin's seven dirty words, and you have to say the station ID at the top of the hour. Um, other than that, you can go pretty much free form. There were times when I would have uh, two, three, four different sound sources all running at the same time for an hour nonstop while I was drinking with friends who were somewhere else and we get back to the station at the top of the hour and go, you are listening to WRV National, and I can rock. And that was it. And, uh, that was it. <laughs> yeah, 91 Noise, Bow Tiny X. Yeah. Holy shit, you heard the show? Okay. I knew it. All right, so um, the, the interesting thing with college radio stations is you have a lot of people who will come in at the beginning of every fall semester, get all fired up about it, and they'll show up for maybe two or three shows and realize, oh, there's some work involved here if you don't want to sound like an idiot on the air. And then they steal a few CDs and they never show up again. So by the time um, spring rolls around, especially when you in the summer, most of the kids go home. College radio stations have a hard time staying on air a lot. That's when, you, that's when you get in there. You may yeah, call into the stations, talk to the, the DJs on the shows you like, and maybe ask if you can get a tour of the station during your show, help them pull some CDs or records, and find out when they have a sign-up meeting. Maybe sign up for a community class or something if you want to give yourself a little bit more legitimacy. And you can pretty much have your own show in the summer if you work at it a little bit. And this information spread in around Nashville. We started getting more and more community volunteers, quote unquote, showing up um, to DJ at WRVU. And they, the Vanderbilt staff, a lot of people um, in the administration of Vanderbilt do not like WRVU. They feel it does not properly reflect the Vanderbilt image. Because, you know, when they play not the industrial and speed metal on occasion. And, um, a lot of Vanderbilt students don't listen to it, but it is the only alternative non-commercial radio station in North Tennessee. So outside of the Vanderbilt community, WRVU has a huge following. And a lot of these people show up and start doing shows. And the great thing about college radio is even if you don't like one of the shows you're hearing, you've got another DJ coming on usually in two or three hours, and you'll hear something you can't hear anywhere else. We started getting a lot of interesting specialist shows. People started winning awards. And it, became, it came to the attention of the Vanderbilt administration that a lot of these award-winning DJs were students, they weren't faculty or staff, they weren't alumni, but why the hell were they in the DJ booth controlling the 14,000 watt transmitter? And they started to purge all of the community volunteers, I guess, about six years ago, and then realized, oh, if we get rid of these people, we're going to lose this show, which won these awards, we're going to lose this show, which got these good press write-ups, we're going to lose this show. And they wrote in, actually wrote in a clause um, adding a fourth category, which was community volunteers. So you may want to check and see if the college radio station in your area is, will allow community volunteers to do DJ shows, especially when um, there aren't a whole lot of students on campus. And um, things were going great with RVU for many, many years. Right now, uh, there's been some problems over at the radio station. Sources inside tell me that they've got basically a spoiled young chick who's the station manager and she's on a power trip and they've purged a lot of the old-time DJs, uh, which is why one of the reasons why Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt WRVU is not on the air here as much as you would expect this time of year. I think they're having a hard time making it more than 12-hour day broadcast schedule. And if they keep that up, they're going to have um, their license either reduced or possibly transferred to another station. I know. Um, WMTS down in uh, Murfreesboro would love to be able to up their power and possibly steal away some of the Vanderbilt audience. So there'll be an interesting situation to watch and see how it develops. Also, we have some of the Vanderbilt DJs here to give a little bit more information about that because I have heard a few conflicting stories about what's going on exactly within the within the station, and I don't want to spread uh, 
rooms unless I've got some facts to back them up. I do have emails from several DJs that are removed all pointing to basically the same person who's causing problems. So, Does she like big band? Um, apparently, her main problem was with the community volunteers. A lot of them there, a lot of them had simply been at the radio station for years and years more than she had, and some stupid policy decisions were being put in place about what could be played or not played. She was messing around with specialty shows, and a lot of the longtime DJs were getting to the point like, okay, you know, at, at the time she was 19 years old and she was a station manager, and they were kind of giving her the attitude, you know, we've been here longer than you. GMs usually don't stay in a position of power for more than one year. We're kind of basically ignore you, and you can fuck off, and next year someone who knows what they're doing will be in charge. Well, um, the the group, the student group that runs WRVU is known as the E staff. The core E staff voted to kind of rewrote their election laws a little bit without telling anybody else, and then uh, basically elected this chick again for a second year as GM, which I don't think that's happened in about 20 years. And uh, they basically threw out most of the community volunteers and saying, well, the, these slots should be reserved for Vanderbilt students since the station is here for Vanderbilt students, which is a load of shit because they can't put enough students in the station now to keep the station on the air 24 hours a day. Yes, ma'am. First time I ever listened to the station, I was listening to streaming audio and somebody, a bunch of people had told me about it. And I was listening and they were doing old time jazz, whatever. DJ wasn't too bad. But he's going on and go, I'll be here for another hour, I'll be here for another two hours, whatever. Mid, mid chant rock, whatever. Transmission. Transmission. Yeah. They just cut themselves off. I mean, well, not five minutes before, the guy had said, you know, oh, I've got another two hours on my shift. And, I mean, he just stopped and everything just went dead. Transmitter could have died. Uh, no, I called the station right after that. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> they just said, oh, you know. Oh, yeah, this yeah, is the end of the show. In case you're interested, the way they transmit out there is uh, they've got 256K leased lines that each one transmits, uh, each one delivers one stereo channel from Vanderbilt to the transmitter. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, college radio stations around here, as I've said, WRVU 91.1 FM, which is Vanderbilt Station, WRVU.org. Yes, sir, in the back. Step closer so I can hear you. I don't want to set you off track on your talk, so if you want to file this question, that's fine. I'm easily distracted. I usually go off track anyway, don't worry about it. What's your question? Uh, how do you think that uh, you know internet radio plays in here? Like, how difficult is it to set up a legally licensed internet radio station? And you know, do you see that as a reasonable alternative for people that want to produce interesting like content? That became a lot more difficult uh, just within the last couple of days. I'm going to comment on that you know, towards the end of the talk. But basically, a lower court decision was reversed on streaming internet audio and the fee structure for that. And under the current court decision, if you're going to do streaming internet audio with uh, copyrighted content, you're going to be paying a lot more money than is acceptable or possible for the typical hobby broadcaster. This decision may be overturned when it goes to a higher court but it's going to be a slow process. And on one side, you've got everybody's friend, the RIAA, and all of their lobbyists who simply want to make money. I mean, nothing against making money. Making money is good, but yeah, they, they want to make money to the exclusion of everything else. I guess that's what they're there for. But at the same time, um, they're kind of setting these pricing schedules unfairly so that you're typical hobby or non-commercial broadcasters will not be able to compete. And there is a reason for that. Um, the National Association of Broadcasters, which represents commercial broadcasting interest in the United States, um, and the RIA and the major labels, don't really want competition and they don't want alternatives to their radio stations. And this all goes back to the money issue again. If you have if you have a wide choice of things you can listen to, different radio stations, including a lot of community low-power FM radio stations, if you have streaming internet audio, you're not listening to the Clear Channel near Monopolies and the other big commercial stations, and therefore, they're losing audience, they can't charge as much for their advertising. They don't want you to have alternatives. Um, I got you a second ago, let me get this gentleman to ask a question, yeah. The whole thing is pollution of Delusion of control, yeah, that's, that's a very good one too, yeah, thank you, good phrase. 
Yes, ma'am. Along those same lines, though, um, under that ruling, it's not just the small little independent streaming audio. It's also apparently major radio stations who are broadcasting over their websites, doing stream the, the exact same broadcast. They're having to pay double for the songs that they're playing. Yeah, yeah. The laws are screwed up, and the lobbyists and commercial interests have really kind of fucked up the licensing schedule. Uh, the licensing schedule, licensing fees, the fee structure. It's going to take a while to untangle this. Uh, right now, only really the largest. Um, chains, radio networks, can afford to do it. And um, let me get off the... Oh, yeah, a couple other comments about uh, college radio. There are um, there are some organizations and groups of people, I mentioned the National Association of Broadcasters and Commercial Broadcasters, who don't like things like college radio stations because it's an alternative, you're not listening to their stuff. Another group that apparently has a problem with college radio stations, especially those that are pretty much entirely student run and broadcast a lot of rock and roll or alternative music are religious organizations. <laughs> surprise, surprise. There are, there are many documented in instances of uh, religious radio stations causing malicious interference to college radio stations, starting letter writing campaigns claiming that uh, college radio stations are broadcasting obscenities and, and um, from personal experience, this does happen. When I first started broadcasting at WRVU, we got a letter into the radio station from a young woman who really enjoyed the metal show. And um, her dad was apparently a minister at one of the more conservative fundamental churches around here. And she tipped us off to the fact that there were a group of about half a dozen churches that were monitoring WRVU 24 hours a day. They would call in and try to get DJs to play things that had cuss words in them or things that couldn't be played on the air. And every Sunday after the regular church sermon, they would sit around and they would coordinate letter writing campaigns to the FCC complaining about WRVU. This is not what they put in the letter, but according to this young lady, what was said in the sermons were, uh, was basically that, and this is a quote, um, we are of the devil and corrupting the youth of Middle Tennessee and must be stopped. The agents of Satan must be removed from the air. They were speaking nothing to the truth. Well, yeah, but we do have freedom of speech and freedom of religion in this country. If I want to go out and be a devil worshiper, no one can say, you know, no one can say, no, you can't do that. Well, they can say that, but they can't stop me from you know, worshiping Satan or Bob or whatever it is I want to worship. So, say again. Microsoft Bob. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sir. Is that the genesis of the devil music promo? That's part of it. Yeah, yes. I think it's so yes, awesome. yes, it is. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of. Uh, we were listening to our view a little bit. I haven't heard any of the ones I did, but I made confession time here. My show was usually Saturday late night, early Sunday morning. Uh, I would go on the air at midnight and go technically till 3 a.m. Sunday morning, sometimes longer if uh, the 3 to 6 DJ didn't come in. So I had the people who had to listen to the radio and then go into church a few hours later. So they weren't getting any sleep, and I figured I'm going to make this as unpleasant for them as possible. And hence was born 91 Noise, Middle Tennessee's only noise, experimental, especially Japanese noise, radio show. So I had three hours of feedback, you know, I'd the name Noi Bowden, Maris Bowden, the Gary Gary, Gay Gay Gay, chainsaws, random explosions, several sound sources going at once, all dedicated to these people. Every now and then I would throw in negative lines, Christianity is stupid, or it's DC's dear God. And uh, this prompted uh, usually a fair number of phone calls, especially when I was off on a good rant. And about half of the phone calls would be from kind of sad but concerned people who were worried that you know, I was filled with so much hate and they were going to pray for my soul and because, yeah, Jesus did love me. And these people, okay, you know, you're not trying to force your stuff on me. Um, you're not judging me. This isn't directed at you. I got no problems with you. Okay, you, know, you seem to be a nice person. This is directed at the people who call in and tell me that I'm going to burn in hell and they're going to shoot my mother and rape my dog or something like that. I have a lot of phone calls like that. And let me tell you, once you take the obscenities out of them, they make really great station IDs and promos. 
And this is one of the reasons you get in radio, because the people who call you up, you can record their phone calls and legally broadcast them over the air again. So if you do good stuff, it's a lot of fun. Okay, I had some of the most creative uh, PSAs and station IDs on WRV uh, from people who really wanted to kick my ass. It was great. So there was, I'm trying to remember what the church was here out in Fairview. There was a low power sort of community radio station for a while. One of the church organizations out there was pretty much overpowering their transmitter and drifting a little bit off frequency so they could deliberately interfere with this station. And the way they get away with a lot of this is, let's admit, you know, churches, nonprofits, they got a lot of money. And uh, they believe they're doing, you know, the Lord's work. So you've got basically a bunch of fanatics, religious fanatics with money behind them who are going after um, small college radio stations for the most part that don't have big pledges. For instance, WRV use budget, you think Vanderbilt University, you know, they burn money for for heat in the winter when they're, when they're cold. But WRVU gets maybe ten thousand dollars a year for its annual budget. All it takes is one big FCC fine and it's fucked. Um, there have been several instances where the transmitter has gone down due to the weather, you know, stuff's out there 24 hours a day, heat, snow, ice, rain, whatever, it does break occasionally. And WRVU has been off the air for months at a time, and they simply didn't have the budget to prepare stuff. So, a uh, college radio station option is fun, it doesn't it take as much social engineering as some of the other ones, and under the right circumstances, it can give you the most freedom to be creative. I mean, you don't have to play just music. I've done talk radio shows, call-in talk radio shows, those were a lot of fun. And um, you get access, you get exposed to a lot of different types of music, and the only thing I'm going to request you do is don't be a dickhead like a lot of college radio students who go in and DJ for maybe half a semester and steal music from the stations. It takes a, a lot of work to get good music sent to radio stations on a regular basis. And if you steal stuff from the station, I mean, how hard is it to burn a seat nowadays? You know, if you steal stuff from the college radio station, you just deny everyone else from hearing it. That's one of the reasons I started my large music collection you know, was because I got tired of going in and playing and showing like, oh yeah, this song will mix great in with this one, I can do this. Half the music I want to play was gone. So, if you want free music, working in a college radio station is a good way to get it. You can simply contact. Excuse me, belts. We'll edit that out, right? Uh, you can simply contact the uh, smaller record labels and send them copies of your playlist every week. And say, look, I your stuff here. The bands I play. Here's what I'm on the air. Um, can you send me some more stuff from your label? Or we used to have this disc and it got stolen. You know, send it to. DJ, whatever your name is, at care of the radio station. So, you know, I'm not trying to scan free CDs out. I mean, a lot of times when you do that, um, help alternative tentacles. You know, then Joel the offered Dead Kennedys. Uh, I got two complete sets of everything alternative tentacles had in print um, when I met Joel the offer a few years ago and asked about this. And one set went into rotation at the radio station, and the rest was for me. I just basically said, okay, yeah, cool, if you're going to play on, you know, thanks for the playlist and keep, keep it up. If you want more of our stuff, here's one set from the station, here's stuff for you. Yes, ma'am. I've always heard also, I used to work in bookstores a lot, and that was uh, something fairly standard that they used to do, and it was almost like a, a little extra perk if you like books. You would get extra copies, preview copies of all these different things, a lot of times even before the official book came out, and they would give them away to the employees. Isn't, yeah. I mean, I've always heard that radio stations yeah, would that like happens to a lot too. extra and copies and previews. That happens a lot too. Radio stations will get out a lot of promo stuff that never, it, that's not available for sale. In fact, um, we uh, we would get remixes, we would get live versions of stuff, we would get CD singles, entire albums of things that were never for sale to the public. And um, again, you know, a quick copy, and there you go. Got some interesting nine inch nail stuff back when they used to be cool, and um, just all sorts of oddities. A lot of the stuff eventually winds up on the peer to peer networks or on the used out music groups is a uh, rarity of the things. Um, okay, I've told you about the college stations up here in Atlanta. Check on I mean, up here at National, sorry. Uh, check around down in Atlanta. We've got WREK, which is 40,000 watt radio station from Georgia Tech. I'm going to start doing. Um, uh, helping out with rather the hour of Slack. I'll get to you in a minute. I'm going to start helping out with the hour of Slack, which is the Church of Subjects broadcast there now that no longer work weekends. And uh, I didn't know this station existed. WRAS, uh, which is George State University's radio station, 100,000 watt student radio station. It's the most powerful student run radio station in North America. 
Don't fucking yeah. All I gotta do is sign up for one class at GSU, and I'm behind the mic of a 100,000 watt transmitter in a major metropolitan area. I would piss off so many more people than I ever upset here in Nashville. Cannot wait. Okay, yes, sir. No, when I first started DJing at WRVU, basically, uh, we took a test that was uh, pretty much a competency test. This is how I run the board, this is how I turn the transmitter on and off without blowing stuff up. Uh, this is shit I don't say on the air like I just said right there. And uh, that's all that was required. At the time, the SEC would send you, uh, uh, wasn't in class two or your telephone operator's license. It was, yeah, yeah, they would still send those out. Nowadays, um, with the college radio stations, uh, pretty much as long as the general manager or the staff in charge of the radio stations certify that you are technically competent and you know the FCC regulations, the coach take your word. It's kind of like a general license. The station's got the license to broadcast and they assume they're going to train the DJs. If they get complaints, then uh, they investigate. Oh, the church stuff. Let me wrap that story up real quick. This was fun. Um, I tormented these people for a while, and so did various and sundry other folks. And what eventually happened was that was the closest FCC field office is in Atlanta. They sent an agent up here uh, very quietly one week, and the guy checked into um, whatever that hotel is across the street from Vanderbilt, the uh, big one on uh, West End, and just sat in his hotel room, uh, kind of monitoring the station or listening to it when he was driving around his little green car, and went back to Atlanta and filed his report. And we had a copy of the response hanging out in the station wall for a while. It got taken down when the station relocated one point, but it's still probably on file. And the FCC letter that was sent to these churches, and a copy was sent to us as well, it said basically, they're doing nothing wrong. They're a college radio station. Uh, if you don't like them, you don't have to listen to them. Why don't you spend your efforts doing something more creative and productive for the community in which you're in? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, something that Nashville does not have, but it should have, is a good community radio station. Again, this is a pretty much non-commercial radio station, it's not affiliated, affiliated with any um, university or college or anything that's run by volunteers, usually unpaid volunteers, uh, sometimes a bureau manager and music director with paid small salary, just because it is a big job running something like this. We've got a really good station down in Atlanta that's 89.3 FM. It's also 100,000 watts. And, um, Good mix of jazz, blues, reggae, uh, community news and events. Um, pretty much what music and news type radio could be um, if it's done well and if you eliminate the, the driving you know, commercial interests that pretty much exclude everything else. Uh, unfortunately, I'm getting here. I don't remember the call letters for the station. It's just 89.3 FM, but you know, Google 89.3 Atlanta Community Radio Station. You know, probably find them pretty easily, and they, well, they were streaming as of a couple of days ago. I'm not sure what the streaming situation, how that's been affected because of this recent court decision. Uh, Nashville could use something like that. I think it would be a wonderful thing to kind of give you some uh, variety, uh, aside from the, the top 40 crap and uh, WRV, which I love dearly, but God damn, how many techno shows do you have to have? You know? So like every new DJ who comes in wants to do that techno dance show. Um, low power community FM, LPFM, was supposed to be the alternative for that. Who knows what I'm talking about? Hands up. And real quick, since I'm going to watch time check, uh, I want to make sure I don't write anything. We have about five minutes. Oh, shit. All right, I'll talk fast. Uh, low power community FM radio was supposed to be the alternative to the commercial monopoly. Um, you had several different broadcast ranges between 10, 100, and 1,000 watts. And what this was supposed to do is the FCC investigated very carefully and made sure that these stations would not cause interference to make through commercial broadcasters. These small stations were supposed to be non commercial, serve the local community, and preference was going to be given to stations that were not primarily religious in organization because there are enough religious stations out there on the FM, especially the AM and the shortwave bands. Unfortunately, the National Association of Broadcasters, again, saw, you know, ah, competition, alternatives, we don't want this. So they went in basically and lied to Congress, um, made up this CD that they handed out to Congressmen saying, if we allow this to happen, it will destroy commercial radio in the United States. It will cause interference. All radio stations will sound like this. And they played this CD and had two stations interfering with each other and a whole bunch of static, so on and so forth. 
They created that in the studio. It came out after the laws had gone in, uh, pretty much banning the what would allow the most low dark media FM stations. They couldn't find a situation where they could accurately record this during the conversation. They just made it up. And you've got lobbyists here with false information. They lied to Congress versus the FCC, who their engineers have been regulating the airwaves and keeping them interference free and usable for decades. But money went out, and what they did was they uh, eliminated the clause of low power FM radio, which would have allowed for what's called single channel spacing. The FM dial goes from 91.1, 91.3, 91.5. Um, for large commercial stations, you have to have three of those channels between them. You can't have commercial stations on 91.1, big powerful commercial stations on say 91.1, 91.5, because the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to cause um, secondary tertiary harmonics. And inadvertent interference will make that please and it out. And um, low power FM stations would not have caused this kind of interference. The FCC researched it for years before they put it on the drawing table. The National Association of Broadcasters convinced Congress, no, no, the low power FM stations have to be spaced out the same way the uh, high power commercial stations are. And that made instead of suddenly thousands and thousands of new radio stations popping up all over the states. Um, there were only a couple hundred slots available and none available in the metro, major metropolitan area because all the available slots were already filled up. They thought they were going to be able to put the low power stations in the unused smaller slots. That was taken away from them. We do have a license here in the national area for a low power community oriented radio station. It is WRFN, Radio Free National. Uh, they've gotten their uh, permission from the FCC to do a 100 watt radio station in Pasco, which is out I 40 West towards Franklin and Fairview. They would be on 98.9 FM. Their website is Radio Free Nashville, one word, dot org. And um, hopefully they will be on the air if they don't have any other stalls in about 18 months. They do have a snag that's come up recently, a station in Lebanon, WANT, a five kilowatt religious station, <laughs> has filed a petition with the FCC to deny um, WRFN's license. The reason they're stating is unacceptable interference. WANT is a 5,000 watt station located 70 miles away from the proposed transmitter site of WRFN. Uh, basically what it boils down to is WANT does not want to lose, uh, their signal is only protected after a certain range. People can pick it up outside this range. They don't want to lose the audience who's outside their authorized range to WRFN. They have no legal right to broadcast or be with or expect to be received down in that range, but they are and they don't want um, a community radio station uh, preventing the heathens from hearing the word of God, not that they couldn't hear it from a bazillion other sources. So uh, Radio Free National is will be a good one to get involved with. The low power FM radio movement, uh, they may reverse the decision on the triple channel um, spacing and take it back to single channel spacing if that happens. And once again, you'll see uh, hundreds if not thousands of low power non-commercial community run radio stations start popping up for being a good thing. Um, National Public Radio. The reason I do not send them any more money is because they sided with the National Association of Broadcasters um, as far as low power community FM radio, and they essentially lied to Congress, or they did not speak out about what they knew not be true and allowed this law to go through. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, National Public Radio, which now you know, pretty much plays commercials these days too, accepts a lot of advertising, is pretty much in the same category as the um, uh, National Association of uh, Broadcasters, and I will not donate money to them again. Again, yeah, they didn't. They were worried about losing money and contributions from their listeners, and having people go, "Oh, hey, I can get involved with a new radio station. Why do I need to keep sending uh, my local NPR station money?" So, um, probably your least likely option, in, uh, as far as getting on the air, is with a commercial radio station. A lot of the clear channel stations nowadays, guess what? They don't have DJs. The programming that you hear. It is all pretty much pre-recorded. It's run from someplace else and it's streamed out for a remote transmitter where they've got pre-recorded ads on a computer queued up to be played at certain times between the same songs that are being broadcast uh, out from every other transmitter within the, the network. Can I have a comment? Question? Lots of censorship with uh, 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, the censorship. What, what was the John Lennon song they censored? In, imagine. Oh, they actually censored I think Imagine. So. Why? Why? Wow, it's a wonderful song. I mean, imagine there's no God. Maybe some people were offended by that. So, um, Clear Channel uh, is pretty much the largest uh, chain, commercial chain here in the U.S. as far as broadcasters go. I think they've got 8,000, 9,000 radio stations. They own um, almost half of the commercial FM stations in this country are Clear Channel stations. They own several thousand more over in Europe. They're the East and the and uh, they play nasty and they do things like if you, um, uh, what was it, they ties to Ticketmaster and you know, if you don't go, if you're a band and you don't want to go through Ticketmaster and let Ticketmaster get their cut and you don't want to let Clear Channel get their cut, uh, they pretty much will not give you the new space to play and they will not play your song on the air, uh, play your songs on the air. Um, a couple of bands have gone indie and uh, are having a hard time because they can't get into the, uh, the venue or the anymore. AM, that may make a comeback in the not too distant future. We've been playing a lot of the, the digital digital AM, uh, which should be rolling out more widespread. It's set up a couple of test locations. And uh, digital AM is kind of interesting. We've got a lot longer range, and um, the uh, the sound quality for digital AM approaches FM quality. If you listen to current AM stations, eh, it's not that great. And that's pretty much a cesspool, pretty much. Uh, uh, religious broadcasters these days and sports news, and that's about it. But maybe that'll change. Foreign language stations are ending up on AM these days as well. About a foreign language? That doesn't surprise me. Um, it's not that bad. Let's see. A couple other things I wanted to point out here. FCC is kind of weird in their rulings and uh, their restrictions. Uh, Y'all remember uh, what's his name? YouTube guy, Mono, oh, no. Mono, whatever. They ran this a couple years back. Yes, I ain't fuck on the air. American Music Awards. American Music Awards? Yeah. Um, Correct me if I've gotten this wrong, but the FCC statement for not finding uh, the radio uh, part of the TV stations involved was that um, it was not classified as, it, as obscenity because it was not used in a sexual content. Which, what does that mean if I can... I don't think it was sexual. He, it was, was it not word? used in an obscene. It was not meant in an obscene. Not meant in an obscene context. Context. He, it, was, it was used more as... I've seen being used uh, mainly to promote nothing more than sexual desire activity, if I remember correctly. Yeah, here's the word to mean, really. He said, this is uh, fucking broken. Yeah, fucking broken. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was fucking just, you know, just so an adjective. You know? yeah. So they're kind of weird on what you can and can't get away with. Uh, the rule I used on WRBU was if I saw it, uh, if I heard it on TV, and I used the TV show NYPD Blue as my standard, that I could play it on the air. So all of a sudden that allowed me to play songs with words like asshole and dickhead, and then it was fun. There was a cool William S. Burroughs song, um, song called Did I Ever Teach You About the Man Who Taught His Asshole to Talk? William S. Burroughs, the guy who wrote Naked Punch, if you're not familiar with him. Fun stuff. Um, the interesting thing about the the uh, using fuck on the air is that I hear the classic rock radio stations a lot of times play the who's who are you and you can quite audibly hear who the fuck are you twice in the lyrics and another one was uh, Pink Floyd's song uh, Money when they say bullshit and the commercial stations don't get fined for that so they're kind of selected what they do and they don't uh, find what they will find is um, this happened about uh, 18 months ago. The FCC proposed a $7,000 fine against non-commercial KBOO FM in Portland for broadcasting the song Your Revolution, a collaboration between Ninja Team recording artist DJ Madden and spoken word artist Sarah Jones. The song comes from the DJ Madden, Madden USSR Life from the Other Side, released in 1999. The commission claims that it contains Unmistakably patently offensive sexual references. And uh, KBU County's explanation is to provide a forum for unpopular, controversial, controversial, neglected perspective. And your revolution is a feminist attack on attempts to equate political revolution with promiscuous rock. Uh, now, there were no obscene words in the song at all. They were, they proposed a $7,000 fine against this community radio station because they didn't like the content of the song and some religious groups in the area objected. I hope you got something useful out of this. As I say, it was thrown together kind of last second. And um, 
I was hoping some of the other DJs in the area would be able to show up, or at least one of the radio free national guys could, since they've spoken at Freaking a couple times in the past. But that's about it. Um, I'm not even ranting and babbling to someone else who's supposed to be coming on momentarily. Got any other questions, real quick? Anyone? You want? Okay, thank you.